let me introduce Nathan York. He's an engineering manager at Google. Uh, he's been with Google about six years and been an integral part of making sure our engineering uh, tools and systems have been growing at the scale of Google's growth, both in terms of the users we have and also the hardware, at first the applications and the offerings we have. So uh, Nathan is, uh, calls himself a tools guy, and uh, I'll let him share why he thinks that and also talk about the tools for continuous integration. Welcome, Nathan. Thank you. So yeah, I'm here to talk about uh, tools for uh, continuous integration at global scale. And this is really, this talk will really be about the build system and how we're using the build system to enable this type of continuous integration system. So a quick question, how many people here interact with the build system of some sort? So quite a few, a lot of managers in the audience. Okay, that's okay. Um, so uh, how many people actually really, truly love their build system? They're totally happy with it. Yeah? Okay. That's kind of the response I was expecting. Um, so uh, a bit about kind of what we're doing at, at Google, and this talk will not be just about what we're doing, but how we're doing it. Um, we have a, a dedicated tools team uh, within the productivity area, and we've been working on the, the scaling issue at Google, in particular the challenges that are specific to the way we work at Google. Um, and we've been working on this for about six years uh, with a fairly decent-sized uh, engineering team. And so this talk is really distilling kind of the key insights from six years of development uh, into this one talk to share with you guys. And the reason I'm, uh, I really want to share this with you guys, I'm excited about this, is the first time we've ever really talked in depth about what we're doing. And we want to share this because we feel like build systems are uh, really not talked about much and they're often overlooked um, and, and in many ways underappreciated. Um, and this leads to what uh, I refer to as a software engineering gap, where we spend a lot of uh, time and resources on kind of the very low-level platforms and compilers. We have very specialized people in this area. Um, and then, of course, we hire specialized teams of people to build applications and features. But there's this gap in between where the, the tools that everyone are uh, interacting with are, in many ways, just uh, uh, overlooked and uh, under-provisioned. Um, often developed in-house. Many times it's just some poor guy who gets stuck with it, usually the new guy on the team or an, an intern or something like this. Um, and in most cases, the, the bar is pretty low. It's, you get to the point where the tools are good enough to use, and then you move on. Um, and hopefully you'll see in this talk that we uh, really believe that um, there's so much more potential there. Um, so what this often leads to, and this is probably why a lot of people are frustrated with their build systems, uh, are things like uh, incorrect and flaky uh, builds, um, slow builds, that's a very common one, spending a lot of time waiting for the build system, uh, having a cumbersome and or fragmented build system. So many companies, uh, I believe, once the code gets to a certain size, uh, we, we see that piece of it, pieces of it start fragmenting off into different kind of code silos. And then, of course, there needs to be a process for you know, integrating this stuff all back together, and it can become a very uh, heavyweight process. Um, and, of course, uh, usually this is under-maintained overall. Um, and so one of the, the insights we had here very early on was that uh, make clean is actually the, the sign of a deep flaw in the system. If you think about it, if you, if you don't trust your ability to do a, a, a incremental rebuild, what you're really saying is you don't believe the system has correct information. It doesn't, it's not going to be able to understand what you're doing in a correct sense. And this is one of the things we uh, set out to address. Um, and so there's also a question of why, uh, why build systems matter, right? And of course, in an agile, test-driven development type of model, uh, you know, however long the, the tests and the build takes, that's how long people are waiting at each iteration. iteration. That's important. Um, but also this affects the ability uh, transitively for things like automated build systems and also building and releasing products. Uh, basically, the, the, the build system forms the core of productivity. Um, and in the end, this is all about getting feedback to the user, right? And, and the build system is kind of sitting at the, the core of this uh, feedback loop. Um, and I'll, I'll point out here also that um, one of the things we discovered very early on was that um, in the race to get to speed, oftentimes uh, correctness is overlooked. And we found that this usually uh, is counterproductive. So it's easy to spend much more time diagnosing incorrect uh, build results, flaky build results, 
um, than the actual gains produced by the, the build system. Um, so the challenge we're facing at Google, um, 6,000 engineers uh, spread out across worldwide offices, uh, one code base. Everyone's working on the same code base. Um, people don't generally work from branches. Um, everything is built from source. We don't build really from li libraries except things like system libraries. Um, this has advantages. We don't have things like big integrates, um, so-called merge hell. Um, it also makes the code very open and transparent. Uh, people are free to experiment. It's very easy to go in and, and change some core piece of the system. Uh, this doesn't mean that they can just check in what they're experimenting with, but uh, nevertheless, it's, it, it's very easy to try ideas out. And there's a set process for how to get these changes back into the main code line. Um, and of course, uh, one of the keys to making this all work so that we're not all just sitting around fighting broken builds all the time is very, very extensive automated testing. Um, and there's a link here uh, on the slides to a talk that Patrick Copeland, the director of uh, engineering productivity, gave earlier this year in Paris. Um, he kind of goes over some of this stuff in a higher level detail. So some of this is a repeat of what he uh, talked about earlier, but I'm going to go into more detail. Um, this is an eye chart. Um, it describes really a, a rough outline of our developer workflow. Um, and this is kind of a very rough cut, but this is our understanding of how engineers at Google work. And for those that are probably even in the front row who can't read this, um, the process is really start with a clean client, check out some code. Uh, obviously, the, you have to do a clean build the first time to get the initial build results. Uh, make some modification, run some tests, iterate. Uh, and, and the code review process includes this iteration. Um, and at the point where we actually submit, which is down on the bottom left box there, once that submit goes in, everyone in the company sees it. And if you broke something, everyone's going to see that breakage. So um, just, you know, this is one of the reasons that having good tools for this type of uh, uh, working environment is critically important. Um, so we realized that our uh, older make-based system was really insufficient for what we needed. We needed a better build system. Um, and one of the things that we, uh, one of the insights we had was that build metadata, things like describing the dependencies and the inputs and the outputs uh, in the source code is really a type of source code in and of itself. And as such, it should be treated as any other kind of compiled language. Um, it should be deterministic, well-specified. It should enforce things like dependencies and inputs and outputs uh, being declared. Um, so we built a better build system. Um, it's, uh, it's really an optimized uh, and tuned implementation of a build language. It does dependency analysis and scheduling. Uh, it's not just a build language, but a, a complete build system. Um, and it leverages Google infrastructure uh, to provide scalability. Um, and kind of the, the bottom line in all this is we took this as an opportunity to, to really re-envision what a build system could be. And uh, again, getting back to this uh, speed versus correctness kind of trade-off, uh, we really believe that this is a false choice. Uh, people talk about choosing one or the other, and we decided uh, let's choose both correctness and speed. Uh, so. Moving on to another insight that was a, a core piece uh, conceptually of how the build system works was that uh, this notion of content addressable storage, that we can refer to uh, files not by file names and timestamps, but rather by the, the digest of the content itself. Um, and that we could use, we're in places where we do need to use some type of path to set up an environment for executing a, some type of compiler or tool, we should really be using uh, relative paths instead of absolute paths. Um, this is all really about trying to eliminate global state uh, in the system and to have universal handles to the resources in the build so that we can build a functional build model. So the idea is that you know, in this functional build model, we have uh, files, our values, and expressions, uh, or, or actions as we call them, are transformations of files. So we have this very simple you know, functional equation. Um, and of course, outputs from an action can be inputs to another action. So this is how we set up the uh, dependency graph uh, within the build system. Um, 
it's all well and good, but of course one of the issues with uh, content uh, a digest of the content is that you need to actually be able to read the content to get the digest. And if we're talking about, again, building everything from source code, uh, eventually we, get to, we got to the point where we are reading a very, very large amount of source code. Uh, people were checking out a very large amount of source code. It was taking a very long time to get. The build system was taking a lot of time just doing I.O. to read the contents to get the digest. So we actually built a special purpose file system for providing source to the build system. Uh, for those of you familiar with uh, Fuse uh, file system and user space, um, this is a, a Fuse-based system. Um, it provides only read-only access. Uh, it, it actually gives an entire view of the entire code repository over all points in time. So we can see snapshots of the repository at any arbitrary point in time. Um, it does this efficiently by only pulling content on demand. So as, as users or tools like you know, GCC or Java C or whatever are requesting and opening files, at that point we go and pull the content down. Uh, but we only pay for the content transfer once. We do very aggressive uh, caching and reuse. Um, and the immutable part of the file system is really key to this, right? That we know that the files in the file system don't change until we change the snapshot we're looking at. Um, this also means, of course, that we can keep all of the source code in the cloud uh, until such point it's needed on the uh, workstation. Um, and also this means that we can provide the digests for the content as part of the metadata in the file system. So in Fuse, we're using the extended attributes in Linux. Um, this means that the build system can then get these digests without actually reading the content. Um, and one interesting observation from this, uh, uh, when we rolled this uh, system out, uh, was that only about 10% of the files that were being synced by developers were actually being read during a build. And this was after you know, doing a very good job of trying to limit the scope of what we were pulling down. We were still trying to pull just the dependencies that were being declared. We found that in, in many cases, that was even much too broad. Um, so the next challenge, uh, once we get the source code was to make the build uh, fast. And uh, what we find is that this notion of a functional build system where we don't have global state and the source code is already in the cloud um, allows us to execute build actions in arbitrary locations. So build action can be, again, like a, C, a compile, a link, a Java C, a jar, whatever. Um, and so this allows us to do large-scale large -scale distributed execution of arbitrary actions. And this is language ag agnostic. We could even be running shell scripts or whatever the case may be, as long as those conform to the, the functional notion of the build model. Uh, the scheduling, the parallelism, is really only limited by the shape of the dependency graph. Um, and so there you have it. We can do, we can basically uh, distribute the load across you know, Google uh, production infrastructure. Um, so we can do things very quickly, but of course the faster we make engineers, the more they do builds, and the more they do builds, the more load it creates. And so our next issue is really how do we scale this up so that we're not spending a huge amount of resources on doing a bunch of builds. In many cases, the builds are uh, sharing overlap or having overlapping information. Um, and so what we found is we can actually, one of the insights is that we could do with this functional uh, build model, we can do uh, caching at the build action layer. So if we see the same inputs, and, and again, the inputs are defined by their digest. So if we see the same digest as inputs and the same action um, that we've seen previously, we can just return the cached re result for that. Um, and we avoid actually re-executing it. This means that uh, in most cases, when engineers are doing builds, they're actually getting the build results from people who had done builds previously. Um, it's really the equivalent to like an automatic binary release every time someone checks in code and does a build. Um, but it all happens seamlessly and no one actually sees it as a uh, release. Um, and the, the overall amortized cost is very low. We'll get into some numbers on the results of this uh, in a bit. Um, and then uh, finally, the, the last scaling problem uh, we hit uh, was one with how to deal with the build outputs. We were so effective in distributing this across a large number of machines that we were basically uh, saturating the, the network links and overloading the workstations 
Um, so we had to build a, uh, another uh, uh, file system for storing the outputs from the distributed build on the back end. So the ad idea here is that, again, we can present to the engineer the, the illusion that you know, the build outputs are available locally, but in fact, they're all being stored on this back end system, and they're only downloaded at the point where one of these files is being read, for example, to be executed or uh, you know, to run a debugger on it, for example. Uh, and this is also a fuse-based system. So this is a, a system view of how this works. Um, we have the workstation on the top. We have a, a build, uh, again, the better build system that kind of sits as the user interface between uh, several or two different file systems and another client that talks to distributed builds on the back end. Um, the, the back end is storing and retrieving objects directly to the, ba the object back end. Uh, for engineers, builds look like they're happening locally. They see all of the warnings and things going by on the screen. It looks just like locally. It's going extremely fast. Um, and in fact, all of the activity is happening in a data center. Um, and the interesting thing is that you know the, the data center can even be on another continent, and it's fine. Like We can locate the back ends in multiple locations. Uh, it doesn't necessarily need to be all that close to the engineer. So what does this have to do with testing? I've been going on and on about build systems. Um, this is really a, a backbone for automated testing systems. This is a platform to build upon. And one of the insights we had was that Executing a test is just another form of a build action. A test, you have the, the action being executed is the test itself, the test binary. The inputs are the, the data files, if there are any of those being passed in as input. And the output are the test results, the, you know, the, the test log, essentially. Um, so, and we can break up very large tests. We can shard them into smaller tests. But this allows us to run a very large number of automated tests in parallel as and it's fully integrated with the build system, so uh, engineers can say, you know, I want to you know, make my project and then run all the tests, and this all happens in the cloud, so to speak. Um, this means that uh, at this point we can do automated testing of all changes going into uh, the repository. Uh, currently, about 50% of the activity we see is from automated systems, um, and the automated systems share the same. Uh, action cache with uh, the rest of the, the uh, engineers as well. So, um, the, yeah, the, the interesting thing here is this means that if someone checks in a breakage, for example, uh, the automated systems pick it up very quickly and, you know, emails go out and alarms go off and people get nag mail to, hey, roll back your change, like, you know, you're breaking everyone. So uh, we get very quick feedback to engineers on the state of their change. Um, so this is all well and good, uh, you know, theoretically, but what kind of results are we getting? So our code base actually changes about 20 times per minute. Um, and about 50% of the code changes per month. Um, but we're able to keep up with this change rate, uh, running the, the, the builds. We do about uh, 65,000 builds per day, uh, 20 million per year. Uh, so we run 7.5 7 million test suites per day. Um, this requires on, on the back end system about 10,000 CPUs with about 50 terabytes of memory. Um, and it produces about uh, one petabyte of output per seven day window. This is unique output. Uh, going back to the scaling and the importance of the caching uh, in the distributed build system, uh, we have about a 94% cache hit rate. So. Uh, in most cases, you know, 94% of the time what people are seeing is build results or things that are, are coming back from the cache. Um, only about 10% of the builds are clean. Um, these tend to be things where people are creating new clients or uh, automated systems that are, you know, are doing this out of paranoia. Um, but we believe that most, uh, most of the engineers now have grown accustomed to the idea that it's safe to do incremental builds. Um, and uh, even though we're building all from source and uh, we're generating, you know, a very large amount of output, uh, build times are typically five minutes or, or less, uh, some variation in there, depending on the size of the build. Um, uh, but also, going to the, the title of this talk, why I put global on there, um, we actually get the very similar build and test times in offices around the world. 
Um, so it's very interesting if you think about that. We, we have the same tool, same command line uh, in all the offices around the world, and they all have very similar uh, response, and it's all very fast. It's all you know, within the five-minute area. So this is, a, this is an example of what we're seeing globally. Um, this is uh, average time of builds uh, over a period of days in September uh, from different offices. Um, and this is in milliseconds. Um, so we, we see that there, you know, there's some variation there, but we have Munich, Sydney, New York, and uh, Belo Horizonte in Brazil. And they're all you know, fairly close together in terms of their performance. Um, so it's just to show that you know, we are, in fact, seeing the performance we expect. Um, going back to the uh, clean versus incremental builds, um, the far left bar here uh, over the zero, those are the clean builds. And the bar over the right, those are the uh, incremental builds. Those are the smallest incremental builds where like a single file has changed. Um, and so we see that, you know, indeed most of the build activity is now just doing these small incremental builds, which is what we want. We want people in this kind of tight uh, build, debug, edit cycle. Um, and then also uh, we did some analysis based on how we uh, how we believe users are interacting with the system, basically their frequency of different actions in the workflow, um, and estimated that, and this is a very conservative estimate, but estimated that uh, the, the tools we built are saving uh, about 600 uh, person years. Um, so again, this is a fairly large engineering organization, um, but uh, it's probably even it, more beneficial than this because there, we know people change their behavior when build times improve, right? People get up less to go get coffee and you know, talk and chat and stuff. So uh, we know that there are probably the benefits are greater than what we're seeing. So my conclusion to all this, uh, the build system is really should be viewed as a core component of software engineering. It's, uh, it's unfortunate that I, in many cases it's not. Um, and many of the kind of esoteric principles of build systems, things like you know, hermeticism and correctness and reproducibility, um, are often kind of pushed to the side in, in uh, the name of expediency. Um, and what we're actually finding is that correctness is just as important to speed and scalability as you know, distributing load across you know, many machines. And so uh, kind of the question I want to leave with before I ask questions of you guys is, how much does good enough cost? What's your experience with your build systems? And uh, hoping you guys will come up and talk to me during the, the mingling time, because I'm interested to you know, get more data points on uh, what people's experiences are with this, and uh, again, get people kind of thinking about this. So with that, uh, any questions? We have one up here. Sorry, on your slide number 15, you write something about a cache shared with interactive user. What do you mean with that? Oh, so, uh, sorry, yeah, because it's not very clear. Uh, we have uh, very extensive automated test systems. So as, again, as changes go into the repository, uh, automated systems see that and start running the test uh, straight away. And so those automated systems are using the same caching mechanisms that the interactive users or the, or the developers are using. And so what happens is as those tests are executing, it's actually pre-warming the cache so that when the engineers come along and are doing the next build, they're hitting the, the warm cache. Make sense? Hello. Uh, usually, uh, any build uh, cycles we do is mainly been on a, based on a uh, time cycle, the timestamp. Here, you're talking about uh, metadata, which is actually having all the information for the build to happen. So, will it say which compiler? It, what what information this metadata contains? I mean, and when I check in the code, should I be mentioning uh, what is the compiler it should run on and all those information? Because every time I check in, I have to update the metadata. Is that what is the expectation? Um, no. I mean, obviously, at Google, uh, our, our current build system is a little bit, uh, you know, we're not, we're not dealing with as many platforms, maybe, as some places. Um, so 
uh, the goal is to not have people changing the build metadata frequently, although they can, and it's, it's written in a fairly high-level language. Um, but in general, we don't expect that people are changing the, the build metadata every time they're checking in. Um, does that make sense? So what triggers the build cycle? Is it a uh, check-in? And so, check-in uh, based on timestamp. Yeah, so, so several things can trigger a build cycle. So one, of course, is the engineer just requesting a build. Um, but the, in the case of automated build systems, uh, we have things listening to changes as they go into the repository. And as soon as you know, a change goes into the repository, various automated systems are triggered. OK, thanks a lot. Yeah, you're welcome. So, so, so the question is, how much of the five-minute build time is from the cache versus distributing the load? And it really depends, right? I mean, we have peak load times where there's not a lot of spare capacity, and you know, a, a, a you know totally clean build may take longer than it would otherwise if the cache is not uh, warm. Um, the, the, but the the primary feature of the cache, I would say, is just the ability to scale. If, I mean, if we look at the the cache hit rate that we see. Um, and the amount of resources that's currently taking the build, you can kind of interpolate how many CPUs we would need to have without that caching to do the same level of activity. It would be significantly more expensive. It is more of a, a resource uh, usage issue. Uh, and in the back here. Uh, if I understand it correctly, the complete build is controlled using the build config files and other config files. So uh, how much effort is spent on uh, constructing or building that config files? I mean, how easy or difficult? Uh... Yeah, so the, the, the build language itself, um, we, we've gone through a fair amount of effort to keep it clean and simple. It's fairly declarative. Um, but of course, there are some ways to extend it and, and add more uh, features to it as teams need, need to add those features. Um, the goal, though, is to, to make it as simple as possible for people to to deal with it, it's it's no more. It's hard to make a comparison on how difficult it is, but uh, it's it's not overly complicated, I think. Thank you. Um, it, the the main feature is uh, again, we try to focus on declaring the the dependencies and the the inputs and the outputs, um, along with any other metadata required things like you know options or whatever. We, we try to focus on what the user actually needs rather than forcing them to think about how do we, how am I going to distribute this or how am I going to scale this? There, there's no notion, for example, really of, well, there's some notion of, of threading, but not really, so. Uh, more, more questions? Yeah, so the, the question is how to take care of multiple platforms uh, in, in a build. And so within Google, uh, we do have several different platforms we use. Um, and there is a notion of like uh, host versus uh, target platform. And there are ways to do that. Um, if I could really distill it down to the, the content of the talk, it's really um, the, the definition of the action includes the binary that's being run. So for example, if it's a cross compiler, and it includes the options. So if there's some type of option to target a different host platform, that's all part of the action description. Uh, some part of the code can be uh, common between platforms. Do you like, I mean, uh, do you have a separate compilation for uh, the common part of the code or? Uh... Uh, so we do, we have ways of handling that. I can't really go into it here, but okay. So yeah, we, we do have ways of dealing with that. Yeah. Anything? Okay. 